All right, Professor Banos, thank you so much for coming and joining me. Happy to be here in your apartment. <laughs> yes, uh, I know it was a big ask, but I really appreciate it. Um, I just hoping to start off giving you an opportunity to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your, where you're from and who you are. So my name is Pamela Banos, in print. People call me Pam to my face. Um, I always ask my students to call me Pam, but they have a real hard time doing that the longer <laughs> I've been teaching. It wasn't so hard when I was younger, but since I let my hair turn white, it's been a thing. Um, I was born and raised in Chicago, although I ended up going to school in Des Moines, Iowa, where I lived for six years, then came back to the city um, to go to graduate school and have stayed here since. Um, my childhood, in talking about my trajectory, um, I think I could probably thank my father for all of the different interests that I end mm. up having, which are evident in, in my work. My dad, both of my parents are children of Greek immigrants, so they were first-generation Americans and like were dealing with Greek in the house and their family, <laughs> their parents didn't speak English very well. <laughs> My dad grew up in Humboldt Park. My mom grew up in Lakeview here mm. in Chicago. Um, but my dad in particular, also my mom too, because my mom went to college, and she's the only person who went to college in her generation in my family. And my dad um, did not go to college, and like most Greek people, um, had a restaurant. Mm. And his particular <laughs> restaurant he had with his mother in a dining car in, a, in the train yard here in Chicago, and it was called Ma's Diner. Anyhow, so... He had the traditional like Greek restaurant, although it was a greasy spoon diner for railroad executives, but he had all of these other interests that he was hmm. um, also doing. He'd get up at 4.30 in the morning to open to serve breakfast, but he also, and this is from the time I was like four or five years old, he had a black belt in judo. So we would go to the Uptown Dojo, it's ironic because I live in Uptown now, and um, we would see these judo matches. He was also a shrine clown, so simultaneously <laughs> with being like this black belt in judo, a judo instructor, he would, all, and this came a little bit later, um, <clears throat> but we would go to parades and my dad would be a clown in the parades or he'd be on the corner at the Medina Temple when the shrine circus was in town. So there was that. In, for his 40th birthday in 1966, my mom bought him sculpting lessons, so he started doing these, he started working in bronze, he started making <laughs> bronze busts. <laughs> So he made like 40 bronze, but there's a bronze of me as like a 10-year-old. Oh my God, no way. 10-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else? So we had this restaurant. He was a black belt in judo. He was hanging out with artists in the late 60s and going to happenings. And we went to gallery shows. And we went to the dojo. And like, you were going to gallery shows with your dad when you were growing up? Yeah. That's crazy. In Chicago <laughs> during like weird, when, during weird movements yeah. in the late 60s and the early 70s. He was also in the Gold Coast Art Fair, so he would go to these art fairs where people would have like macrame and, and like weird yeah. paintings, and yeah. he would have his bronzes all on pedestals. <laughs> like, and they weren't really for sale, they yeah. were, you know, but he just like, you know, I don't forget the phrase that he used, like making the scene. He liked just being in the world. Yeah. He just had all these different interests. Wow, so, I, I like that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so when I so the first time I saw a Fellini movie, I was like, this is like what I was growing up with, where everything is weird, but it's like what your world is. So, yeah. Well, well on that note, and on those all of those interests yeah. of your dad, I would love to know about like your own aspirations and kind of when were the first times you saw a trajectory for yourself, or maybe if there were first things that you were like, I want to do that in the future. My trajectory is really weird. Um, so I teach in the art department where I've been since 1993, so I've been here for almost 30 years, and I studied psychology and sociology as an undergrad. Oh, interesting. I'm a cognitive science major, so. Which is fascinating. Like, I was taking classes that I was really fascinated by. Yeah, I wasn't totally. thinking about a job. I wasn't thinking about where could I, what could I do with this. It's funny because when I graduated with my degrees in psychology and sociology as a double major, I actually wrote to... Howard Becker, who used to teach here in the sociology or anthropology department, and he had a book, and he wrote this book about um, sociology and photography and using it as a means oh my of God. research. And I wrote him a letter asking, because I was interested in photography at that point, whether I should pursue an MFA in photography or I should consider going on in graduate school to study sociology. I'm asking a sociologist. Yeah. So of course he comes back and he says, you should get a PhD in sociology. I still have the letter written in ballpoint pen, which is kind of awesome. 
I ended up not doing what he said, but I ended up here, which is even weirder. So I'm at the school teaching in the school where he was, but I took a different trajectory. Yeah. So, so I started being interested in photography halfway through my undergraduate career, and at my school, there was no photo classes. There just didn't exist, and there was a dark room in the basement of the dorm that I was living. And I had a how-to book, and I went down there, and I three hours later came out with a print. And I just kept doing that work, and I also kept studying what I was now entrenched in, because I couldn't, there was no, where, nothing for me to do with my photography interests. Then I um, befriended an art instructor mm -hmm. who was teaching drawing, and my photographs took these weird turns, and my photographs ended up looking like drawings. It was a real strange period. It was like 1980, basically. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so I was making these little arrangements <laughs> on black paper with little twigs and chalk markings, uh -huh. and I would have a, a light pen, and I would draw on it, so they were photographic because of this light. Yeah. So I was creating these little kind of ritualized scenes yeah. that I was just sort of doing intuitively. Hmm. And there were lots of exhibition opportunities at that time, like big group shows in all different places. And I kept making slides and sending them out. And I got into every show because they looked like no other photographs. Yeah, yeah I bet. It doesn't sound like no, they do. <laughs> no, even today, they're yeah, weird yeah. to see them. But because they were so different, I always got into shows. Yeah. I got into museum collections. I got these exhibition opportunities. I was having solo shows. That must have been really exciting. Yeah, but I also didn't know what am I, <laughs> why, what, it, where is this going? Yeah. And now I'm living in Des Moines. Yeah. After I graduated, and so then I started looking for graduate schools, and I didn't know where I was going to go. And then I end up back in Chicago. At I end up going to UIC. Well, actually, here's an interesting trajectory. I only applied to two schools. I applied to the San Francisco Art Institute and the Art Institute of Chicago. I got both rejections on the same day. <laughs> and I, then I didn't know what I was going <laughs> to do. Awesome. And I was in Iowa. And I'm like, I need to do something. So I actually came to Chicago for something. And I went to some art opening. And someone said, come to UIC. You're going to meet Joe Jockna and Robert Stiegler. And they're going to look at your work. They're going to like your work. And you're going to get into this program, which happened. So that exactly happened. Um, I got into that program. I got my MFA. I basically wanted to learn how to use equipment because yeah. I was completely yeah. self-taught. <laughs> yeah. But that's not what they do in grad school. In right. grad school, you right. develop the vision of what you've already established. So I've always done things like not the traditional route. Um, and then by the time I finished graduate school, now I had this like photography skill. Yeah. So I started doing assisting for commercial photographers because mm. I'm using the skill. Yeah. But also, <laughs> back in 1970 when my dad turned 50, um, he had a midlife crisis and he sold his restaurant okay. and didn't work for three years. While my, I have two brothers. While we were all in college at the same time and there was no income, <laughs> we were on financial aid yeah. and we were figuring it out because I mean, yeah. things cost a lot less then. Like my, my uh, stipend as a graduate TA was, or what the tuition was, like $3,000 at, oh, wow. at UIC yeah. and it was a state school. But anyway, so my dad ended up selling the restaurant um, and being unemployed for three years. Then he bought a liquor store in Naperville, which is this suburb yeah. of Chicago that at that time it was surrounded by cornfields and it was just like in the middle of nowhere. I end up working at the liquor store for 10 years. Oh my God. So I have like, like all these things that happen yeah. and then there's like a long stretch yeah. of you know, I'm doing my own work. So I'm yeah. working in the studio in my own work. I'm making fine art. I'm getting uh, Polaroid grants and Polaroid Corporation. I'm using their materials in a way that they hadn't been used. Polaroid's buying my work, sending me Polaroid film in exchange. I still have a refrigerator with Polaroid film. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned that in class. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I, ha I had yeah. to buy a refrigerator to hold all the <laughs> film that Polaroid sent me because yeah. I was shooting large format. So I was basically working this really non-traditional scheme where I was on a 311, 11, 3, 3, 11, where I would get in my car. I was living in, in, the, in Lakeview area in Chicago, and I would drive to Naperville. The liquor store closed at 10. I'd be back home by 11. I'd work in my studio until 3. I'd go to bed until 11. I'd wake up at 11, get back in my studio, and at 3, I'd drive back to Naperville. So I was on <laughs> this weird thing. So I started making work. Yeah. And so seven years out of graduate school, a friend of mine who was teaching here at Northwestern said that there was a position opening and asked me to interview for it. And I'd never taught out of 
since I was a TA in graduate school. I'm seven years out of school. I have an extensive exhibition record. Yeah. And um, so I interviewed for this job. It's the only job interview I have ever had. And I basically put together a class, which is the class I would have always wanted to take because I wasn't an art student. And most of my students aren't art students. So I put together an entire syllabus hmm. for this interview with readings and you know the fact that everyone has to write a paper. Um, and it's still the syllabus I use 30 years later. Wow. Yeah. Was that, that was a, so you mentioned like the readings and that, and that's not really a, a highly typical thing for the art classes I've taken. Right. Can I ask you about the reaction yeah, we to that? I had readings that first, that I did so much more than I, and I ended <laughs> up pairing so much of that off. <laughs> Like we, yeah, we did readings, um, and we do readings in the class yeah. that you're in right yeah. now, but it's a studio seminar. It's a different totally. kind of thing, but introduction to photography, there, people still have readings, and we read about theory. We read about Susan Sontag and what her ideas were about carrying a camera. I mean, this is 1993. There was no digital anything yet, yeah. and the way we talked about photography was different. We just assumed it would cost money. We didn't, you know, like, it's just what photography was. So this is a great transition. Sure. I really would love to talk about the class that I'm taking with you right now. Yeah. It's called Time in the Invisible. Um, and I've been really interested, I mentioned this to you, in how professors let their own work inform the curriculum that they put forward. So can you tell me about how time became a fundamental element to your practice? Well, <laughs> photography is time and space. And... I think it became more obvious to me because I've been teaching the same class for almost 30 years now. Yeah. I think next year will be my 30th year. So I have all these records of you know, the time that yeah. has passed. I'm still in pretty close contact with a lot of my class from 1994. It was an incredible, I was a young teacher. Yeah. It was new, it was fresh. They were very excited and they did really great work. Um, and they're all like 45 years old now, which is so strange. And so, um, and I, a lot of times I'll talk about on the first day that everybody in the room looks the same, and every year I'm a year older. So I say I've spent my whole entire adult life with 20 year olds. Yeah. And I keep getting older, you're all the same. The conversations change with technology. Yeah. Um, those students are, you know, 45 years old. So I'm always interested in that as I'm on my own trajectory. And in the way that my art practice veered, I became really interested in history of a certain place yeah. and the passage of time. Um, Specifically on the topic of time and the invisible, I wanted to ask you about eighth, eighth and fourteenth, and Vivian Mayer, Meyer, 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 Vivian Meyer. Meyer. Yeah. Um, could you explain a little bit about those projects because they're absolutely fascinating to me? Um, you know, just to touch on them, basically, you created for eighth and fourteenth. It is this really amazing study of this block based on a photo that you bought on an eBay auction that you never knew what these photos were going to look like. And which really relates to Vivian, this person whose life's work came out of a storage locker. I saw the graphic that you made for your book that kind of diagrams where all of that stuff went. I thought that was really awesome and it really relates to time. But can you talk about those two pieces and how they relate to time? Sure, so 8th Avenue and 14th Street is a project that I did in 2003 um, where I had this box of glass negatives that I had acquired, and they were all views of, of New York and Brooklyn because I saw the Bethesda Fountain in Central Park, which placed me there, and there's a street corner picture that I became like obsessed over, like literally. I spent a year in the photograph, and I ended up building a website around the photograph and every detail of the photograph that I was using to try to answer the two questions, which were, where is this picture? Where was this picture taken? And when was it taken? And by the clues in the photograph, which in, it's a real primitive website today, yeah. but there are these rollover links yeah. on the homepage that if you roll over them, it explains what, they, what that told me. So it started with, there's a flag, like on two blocks away. So it's a street corner. It's 8th yeah. Avenue from 14th to 18th Street with the east side of the street visible. And, in, and like two blocks in, there's a, a, a flag. And the first thing I did was I counted the stars, which brought me to within eight years. And then, and then I ended up like looking at the shadows. I ended up seeing like the puddles. So I knew it was red. I was looking at weather tables. Um, I figured out it was an avenue based on the way the light went. They're actually working on um, railroad. railroad um, they're doing something with the street railroad, uh -huh. which was another clue. 
Um, and this is before Google had the kind of information that we had. There right. was no Google Street View. There was no. Um, there was no. We didn't have the resources that we had. This project today, I probably there's already projects like this. You can find maps of New York now that where you roll over and totally. you click on it, you it, it brings up all the photographs that had ever been yeah. taken. Or even just upload. time lapses of the entire yeah. city. Yeah, which is what I'm interested yeah, in. Which yeah, I totally. learned I was actually really yeah. interested in. And also, just to back up sure. with time and history, is that the work I was doing photographically, after I left these weird drawing things, and I went to graduate school, and I started thinking also about the history of photography, I was doing collages where mm -hmm. I was using like a found element, like a found photograph or a postcard, and making a, an original photograph to, it, to having conversation with it. And I presented them together. And then they started merging. And then I start, but I was always using found material right. in relation with my own work. So there was always this kind of looking back as I was presenting some new information. So what the 8th Avenue and 14th Street project opened up is using the archive, and specifically sure. the New York Times archive, where I did keyword searches for 8th Avenue and 14th Street. I ended up um, going to the New York Public Library, where they have all these reverse phone directories, where I could look up every address in the street and find out the history of all the tenants who wow. had lived there. So I built this sort of yeah. sociological One of my history. favorite aspects about it is being able to see the buildings and everybody that was in each That is just, oh my god, it blows my mind. Because I grew up somewhat in the area, so I, I recognize the scenery and like just looking through that, seeing all these different like, company names. Because you see the development of these cities over time. It's very hard to get a grasp of what right. it is. But I thought you did such an awesome job of that. I intended to go back in 10 years and keep and like revisit it. That's a great because idea. Because all the tenants are different now. Yeah. And, and the one, there was one, um, I don't know if it was a Cuban restaurant or a what t type of Hispanic restaurant it was. It had been there for decades, uh -huh. and it just disappeared over the last five oh, years. No. Oh, no. Um, and actually, Hurricane Sandy took the face off of one of the buildings. Like, literally, the whole front fell off. And you could see, like, a dollhouse, all of the, the apartment. It was very strange. Yeah, that's right. And it was one of the pictures in my project. Yeah. You know, and part of what I did with that project is I went there, and I took street photos. Yeah, yeah. I love that section people, of it. And short video, also. Um, and then what I did was I made a brochure. I had my own opening. I did this completely by myself. There was no audience. <laughs> I mean, I put it online, yeah. and there's some implied audience, but I never, I give talks about this, but it was anticlimactic when I finally put it online. But I made these brochures, like an exhibition opening, and I went back to the corner, and I taped them all over the area of the visual Oh, my area. God. <laughs> <laughs> And and then I photographed people taking them off and read because it said I found it, I found this glass negative. It's the story, and you're standing in the area of the photograph. And I included thumbnails of all the street photographs that I took. So whoever was using that as a route became part of the project. That's amazing. And as they're reading it, they're actually realizing they are in the space. That's of the amazing. Photograph. That's so cool. I, I oh my god. So wow. Um, I really am interested in basically. Like I asked you this question when we were walking over there, if you had experience programming, because it was interesting to me that you made the decision to make it in this interactive way, especially that like kind of the bleeding edge of this kind of project on the internet. What was that actually like for you, and why did you decide to do something like that that was, it sounds like, pretty out of your element? I just got so fascinated by, well, actually, I put the project together because it was going to be presented in the symposium. So I was co-organizer of the, with art history department here at Northwestern of this symposium called the American Urban Photography mm, Symposium. Yeah. symposium. And all the speakers were art historians who were reading papers. And I wanted to present something. So I, so that was the out. There actually was an outlet for it. So I premiered the project by navigating through the site and playing the video and demonstrating yeah. it. Um, but what that did was it opened up for me other ways of looking at how I could present things in a nonlinear way, which is what then became the Hidden Truths Project, which is the right. Lincoln Park Project. And what I learned is that in this way that the way, and no one was doing hyperlinks at this point. So it was kind of a, it just turned out that it was sort of cutting edge, even yeah. as primitive yeah. as it looks now, that well, you could just navigate. <laughs> you look at it though, you could tell it's cutting edge at the same time, though, oh, especially funny. because I, I, there's so much, what sticks out to me about it is you kind of, when I was looking at it, my impression was that you had to arrive at that format 
just because of the amount of data that you had. And if you somebody wants to kind of see their own story, they can do that in what you made, and that wouldn't have been possible if you made like a movie, for example, of right. you going through it all. Right, or a book. Yeah, no, absolutely. I wanted to talk a little bit about like your experience as a professor. I know you mentioned like your class of 1994. That's I can't even tell you how interesting that is to me. I would love to know, first and foremost, like a- after kind of your tenure of, of doing this, if you have really changed perception of people um, based on just like seeing young people grow up these year after year after year. Change perception of my students. Yeah, it's, or well, do you look at people differently after having spent all these years teaching and like helping grow young people? Actually, it's that's funny because I was having this conversation with somebody. I was completely average as a student. I had there was there was nothing spectacular. I've always been curious hmm. because of the way that I was by my father. Yeah. <laughs> um, for lack of any other way of looking at it, but what what. I've been surrounded by Northwestern students all this time, and there's a certain there's a certain aspect that Northwestern students have, and you're like the epitome of it. <laughs> like you're curious, and you're um, and you've got energy, and you're like working hard to get something done, and you're thinking about your future. So I'm surrounded by that all the time, mm. and what's been interesting, like teaching photography, where Photoshop didn't exist when I started, that I've had to stay ahead of the learning curve yeah. <laughs> to stay relevant to my students. I've had to know more than they do. So I have been on the edge of my seat constantly trying to stay relevant, trying to stay on top of technology, all of which has sort of changed my practice because I'm learning about coding, I guess, yeah. without knowing I'm doing coding. <laughs> That's the other thing. I'm like, I'm making things that I didn't realize we're cutting edge until you look at it in the past when you can actually see how things, the trajectories that they took. So I credit my students with keeping me on my toes, Hmm. with sort of elevating my curiosity of keeping, so then I, like my friends, I'm like, God, you guys are so lazy. (laughs) I'm surrounded by these these kids who are like (laughs) ambitious and energetic um, with lots of other things because of you know, their trajectory. A lot of students come to school because their parents want them to study business and they want to study art, which is how I have the encounter. And they're conflicted because they'd rather be doing Yeah, I bet you have a lot of that exact situation. Well, I I actually wanted to ask you about, like, the frequency at which, you know, you mentioned that a lot of your students don't go on to be artists. Plenty of your students aren't even art majors. How frequently do they go on to be professional artists? Are there anybody that you think that we should know? Oh, like my my particular students. Um, oh, I wish I could have more time to think about this. There's one. Da- there's one in larger in the darkroom right now that was donated by someone from the class of my class of of '94 who went on to get her MFA. She went on to teach photography and she went on to get another degree. She teaches at Columbia College now, and she donated her enlarger oh. in, in the darkroom. It's the Jessica. It's the Jessica Meharry enlarger. Um, and we've stayed in yeah. touch with different projects and um, as adults now, so that's been interesting. But in terms of like a famous student, I mean, beyond it's famous, even is there people whose work that you like continued to follow and you and you appreciate? That's really what I'm. After. I'm more. I'm. They haven't become artists per se. Um, Apparently, like we have a pretty sophisticated slide scanner in our digital lab right now, yeah. and I think it was donated by a former student yeah. who started some dot com thing <laughs> and became like extremely wealthy yeah. in, you know, in his trajectory and donated that piece of equipment. Um, because I typically don't have art students, and because my class is not required for an art major, right? It's not even in the core curriculum. Is there a core curriculum? Yeah, though? For and, it, and it's been revamped. I'm a minor, in the so list. I wouldn't know. It. Yeah, so we have intro to fo- intro to drawing, intro to sculpture, mm-hmm. and intro to time-based art, which represents 2D, 3D, 4D. And then um, we've basically eliminated all the intermediate classes. Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about it that that's way. That's what, interesting that's what that like is. That, yeah. And so painting, which is sort of an offshoot of drawing, and photography has always just been a sort of satellite sure. to what the traditional you know, art media studio practice is. Um, but... Yeah, so my medium has never been fully integrated in the history of art, and it's always been sort of out here, which ironically, since technology is so 
much of the way we do everything now, you would think it would be a little bit more centralized, but it's not. So, so basically, it used to be introduction to photography, intermediate photography, and at a certain point, like with this back in the 90s, it was like in the fall was intro, in the winter was intermediate, then there was another intro section, and in the spring was color. And a lot of the same students stayed yeah. through this whole thread, and there was like this little community of people who got to know each other's work, and those are the ones who I'm still in touch with because I had them yeah, that makes plenty for of this um, you know, extended period. It's been mentioned to me before by professors, um, and I think that it really hits home for me as I've taken these classes. I've really been informed by my peers and the work that they make. Um, I was talking to Professor Allison Waite. I took a, a sculpture class with her last quarter, and this was something that she emphasized, and she found that in her experience when she was going through art school, what really stuck out to her was like being able to see somebody go throughout their practice and develop it, and that had a much bigger effect than looking at somebody's work that had been published, which makes complete sense to me. There's this really, this, this thing about exploring art and exploring a medium with people that just makes you excited to follow what they end up doing. Yeah, yeah, and I feed off. But I don't feed off the work my students do, I feed off their energy and their, um, their freshness, you know, like, I'm 62 years old. I'm actually the oldest faculty member in my department. No way. <laughs> and I don't have tenure, because I'm on a different track. I'm on a teaching track. So the reason mm -hmm. I'm yeah. still in my department is because student evaluations, <laughs> literally, when I go for um, mm -hmm. up for reappointment or up for promotion, they, they query random students in my class. Really? They go to my class list. I have to get recommendations from my <laughs> students. It's the weirdest thing. It really just completely weird. feels backwards. <laughs> but the students are the only people who know what goes on in the classroom. Yeah, yeah. And so I don't think students really appreciate how important those CTECs are and the way that they're used. I know you use them to see, like, what class do I want to take? And you only see the extremes. This class sucked, and this is, like, the best thing that ever happened to me. Like, simultaneously. You'll see that yeah, that's in so the true. same class. <laughs> and you don't hear, like, all of no, the, you you know, the people that just sort of you know, went along. The, the people so. that just hit submit and didn't write anything. Yeah, especially. or didn't submit anything, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, because they look at the percentage. So it's a, it's a strange thing, but that's why I'm still here, yeah. because that's the only way they know what's been going on in it my It doesn't classroom. surprise me that you've had support from your students, so I have to say. Well, thank you. I just get so excited yeah, about I mean, you know, I, whatever I, I'm doing. I can tell. It's, I mean, I, I have to say, like, I've absolutely loved the class so far, and I found that just, I, I, I always thought about photography as light, the study of light. You've completely changed the way I've thought mm -hmm. about it. It's been really, really cool. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. I wanted to change backtrack a little bit because yeah. I wanted to talk about Vivian. Yeah. I'd love to know just about like your interest in this woman because you wrote your first book about <laughs> this incredible story. Yeah. So what does this story mean to you and how did it come into your life? Only book. I'm never writing another book. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do something else. Um, so this is interesting because the way I got involved in the Vivian Meyer story is through a television station that came to Northwestern's media relations department looking for an expert because that's what they do and there's like we all have our little biographies of what we're good at and mm -hmm. if someone's looking for a sound bite so they came to the chair of my department who at that time was Lane Relier um, looking for somebody to comment on the um, critique of Vivian Meyer that her work was derivative of other photographers yeah. of her contemporaries that she was a copycat and I actually had taken a class to the Cultural Center to see the first Vivian Meyer show that was launched in Chicago. And so I was kind of there at ground zero. Yeah. I actually also saw one of her shows closing in New York, and it was mobbed by people. And this was 2012. And the st her story started in, like, actually 2010 was the big um, show at, at, the, at the Cultural Center. And... Chicago's public television station had done a show on her then, and in the next following two years, there was just this huge like yeah. launch. Yeah. And so they were revisiting the story and talking about what had just happened, and it was a show that was called The Meteoric Rise of Vivian Meyer. And, they, and so they came to my office on campus for a soundbite on whether I thought, what I thought of this critique. <clears throat> and I had a couple weeks to prepare, and the first thing I did was start researching her. And the first thing I saw was that there were hundreds of her photographs online, which even for like phot photographers, especially of her period, you can't find that much of their work online. So all of a sudden, her work looked different. 
I found different things just because I have this research practice. I found a picture of her um, standing in front of the Museum of Modern Art with Salvador Dali, which placed her there at that time. I looked up MoMA's exhibition record and their, uh, their press releases and learned what show was at MoMA while she was standing there, and it was a show called Four French Photographers, and she was, I put together her like story. I did her genealogy, I learned that her mother came from France and her grand, I like did all of this research. So they show up at my office with the video camera and the, and the, you know, the interviewer to answer that question, and they ended up leaving an hour and a half later <laughs> and extended the show into a two-part program. <laughs> and the second part was called, um, searching for Vivian Meyer, not finding Vivian Meyer, which was the movie. So on that program, I demonstrated my research. So I had printed out this map of Manhattan. I started plotting her photographs on the map. I'm starting to follow in her footsteps to understand the way that she's thinking and how she's working. And I'm talking about her as a photographer, which is at, up to that point, she was the mysterious nanny. Yeah. And nobody could believe yeah. that she had this photo totally. practice. And I'm like, I don't find it unusual that she didn't yeah, show her pictures yeah. to anybody. <laughs> I don't find it unusual that she like did this her whole life. And so I became this kind of lone voice. Yeah, support, right? That's how I, the internet yeah. seems to frame it, is yeah. that there was kind of a narrative about this woman As a and mystery. that you really yeah. broke it down. And it yeah. seemed like a lot of that came by the way that her work kind of fragmented all over the place and people controlled the narrative yeah, in different ways. which is not the story that's told. Right. So one guy get, got to sort of form the narrative because he owned the bulk of right. the work. Um, but there was so much moving around of that. So I started giving talks called Vivian Meyer's Fractured Archive. Anyhow, after the public television piece ran, the second major um, Meyer collector invited me over mm -hmm. to his studio because one of the things that, that the narrator said in voiceover at the, end of the, at the end of the episode is what Pamela Banos would really like is to see Vivian Meyer's proof sheets so she could follow her as a student, blah, blah, blah. So he called me the next day or contacted me and invited me to come look at proof sheets that he had. So I went to his studio, which was literally like a Vivian Meyer factory where they were like, making, it was like yeah, production yeah. mode, <laughs> and he sent me home with a hard drive of his entire collection, which I spent the next two years sorting, because they were all disjointed, there were no dates, there were no, there were some dates, but they were all individual frames, so there was no continuity, sure. so I ended up, like the Street Corner Project, sorting them geographically, chronologically, and the book took five years to put <laughs> together, and so I had, there was a third major collector who ended up sharing his collection with me, and I started trying to um, aggregate her collection. This was the same way I sort of aggregated all the information yeah. on the street. So based on, I, had, I made this chart where I sort of followed where her work went and then like skyrocketed that way. Interesting sidebar, right now on eBay, somebody who bought 1,200 of her negatives back in 2008 when John Maloof was selling them to like raise cash to develop her film, which is just also funny, um, they're for sale on eBay right yeah. now. Like right now. <laughs> yeah. Like a guy who's had them for 13 years um, has them online. There's nothing you can do with them because the story just went haywire yeah. because nobody had the right to yeah. publish in the first place, um, which is also part of the book that I wrote, hmm. the behind the scenes, how did this happen, how did she become the mystery, who gets to tell her story, and I asked all these hard questions. So it was a tough journey, that one. I'm really fascinated i asked you when we were on our way like i said um about why you, you don't <laughs> really talk about your work in your class especially because all this seems like so hyper relevant to what we do and honestly a lot of it seems like a, a next step on a lot of the work you talk about there was a great piece that you showed us in which a photographer kind of like modified the flash on their camera to work with their phone to sync up with all these Tumblr or uh, Flickr pictures from the internet where w essentially what it would create is this scene um, in which lights of dots, dots of light um, were placed where different people had taken pictures on the internet. And it really seems like highly related in terms of this way you're so, tracking where yeah. people... So why didn't you tell us about your like, amazing work that's so, mu so related to what we're doing? I don't know. It, I... I feel uncomfortable talking about my own self. Yeah. I mean, I give talks and people come to listen to me. Talk um, about kind of a different thing, though, I would imagine. Yeah, well, they're coming to... Yeah, well, exactly. Or if I, I gave a ton of Vivian Meyer talks before yeah. and after the book. And actually, they weren't interested in me. They were interested in her, yeah. you know? And so my projects, when they're relevant, you know, I, I actually did show my work in the very first 
in the very first PowerPoint that I did. I showed the win taking pictures out of the same window repeatedly. Oh yeah, yeah. But it was for my own. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And you and you kind of said that. You're and like, I this made is the video of yeah, that's of true. my hair growing over a year and a half of teaching these remote classes for my own enjoyment. Because and that's relevant to it is relevant and that is your work. That's a good point. Yeah. But it's not what you kind of right. represent yourself as. So I guess that's right. really the question is is it really just because you're not that comfortable talking about your own work? It's it doesn't it's not always that relevant. Like my my introduction, my darkroom students will say, What kind of photographs do you take? Yeah. And, it, and it feels weird to say I haven't actually taken a photograph <laughs> that must feel really since weird. two thousand three to you know, for yeah. for exhibit and and I still, I mean, I want to stay relevant. I'm not a, I'm not a practicing photographer anymore in the sense that I was when I started teaching yeah. as a studio artist. I mean, my trajectory has taken me from, you know, I do these web-based site-specific projects, or literally site-specific, like I did a project called Temporary Quarters about a building that's now restoration hardware down in the Gold Coast that was a, uh, and I was commissioned to do this at 90 years, it, it housed women studying in the arts. And I was down in the basement of the, it was called the Three Arts Club, and I copied the name of every woman who had ever stayed there for 90 years. And then I transposed them onto the wall of the room that was the library. It was this massive, yeah, wow. massive, <laughs> and I made 190 photographs that represented each year and how many women could stay in the building, and I etched the year that they represented, and I hung those in this one room. So I, and that was a year project. So I mentioned each of the projects when I come up with it that involves research, I give myself a deadline so that it's Yeah, done. you kind of have to. Yeah. yeah, and because they just are so obsessive yeah, and they can course. just keep going. The Lincoln Park project, which we haven't talked about, was 15 months, and it's because I actually put historical markers in Lincoln Park yeah. telling the story that's reiterated on the website, and I actually give tours of the park through the Chicago History Museum. Um, and my pr I've just, like, become... Do you do those regularly? I stopped doing them right before the pandemic yeah. because... I'm like steeped in the, I was steeped in the Vivian Meyer story. Now I'm on to a different project. And the Vivian Meyer project was five years and it was exhausting and it was really hard yeah. because there were people invested in me not telling that story. Oh yeah. There's a whole CD yeah. underbelly yeah. to the Vivian Meyer story, as you might imagine. Um, I do really want to get into yeah. what you're working on right now. Yeah. Uh, Cause it, it is really related to all, all of this. And it, well, it's when you first started talking to Beth, talking about it. I was like, are you talking about Vivian? I'd love to hear, though, about yeah. this project. So there's another photographer who I'm interested in telling her story. Um, and I told Vivian Meyer's story through her photographs. Yeah. Um, and I'm telling this other photographer, her name is Alice Austin, and she's a 19th century photographer. She was born in 1866. And it's an interesting sort of multi-layered story because it's about the house where she grew up in, which still stands on the bank of the Narrows in, as you're entering New York port. You can actually see the Manhattan skyline from her front porch. You can see Brooklyn right across the Narrows. The house has been there since 1690, apparently late in 17th century. Um, she lived there with her female partner for 50 years, so there's this queer history story that's in there also. And she's third generation that was there, and she ends up dying broke. She ends up literally dying, well, she gets sent to the poor house um, and had sold off all of her possessions and the Staten Island Historical Society had taken all of her negatives. She had these bulky glass negatives. Um, and six months before she died, she was rediscovered by someone sorting through the negatives in the basement of the Staten yeah. Island Historical Society. And she was pulled out of the poor house. She was celebrated. Life magazine did a story about her. There was an Alice Austin day. Um, she dies six months later. So... She's get, she gets evicted from her house in 1945. She dies in 1952, so her life sort of trails off. Um, and this family who bought the house move in, and they live there for 10 years. They move out 1955. The house crumbles. It ends up being like a squatter place. There's like it just there's pictures of it that it's really squalid mm. and it kind of falls apart. And then it became sort of embraced again by the New York park system. And in 1985, 40 years later. It opens as the Alice Austin, Alice Austin House Museum. And that year, someone from the family that moved in in 1945 returns to the house with a box or boxes of hundreds of letters that were sent to Alice from 1883 to 1898. It's a real weird, like, it's 15 years. It's from when she's 17 to 32. And it's all the voices coming at her. So wow. what I'm doing with this 
And meanwhile, the house had been restored back to the way it looked in her 1890s photographs, which is also really interesting because they, you know, it had gone through all these permutations <laughs> over the decades, and it was built in, you know, 17, 1690, and it was her grandfather bought it in 1844. There's like all these different periods, and they renovated it back to the 1890s, where the bulk of her work um, that we know about is. So what I'm doing with this information is a podcast series where I have enlisted Northwestern theater students to read from these letters, all of which I've transcribed, another obsessive thing. So I transcribed these hundreds of letters. Um, they've read them all, so I've got the database of all the voices with the letters, and I'm narrating this piece about Alice Austin through the letters that were written to her. So we never hear her voice, but we learn about her through the things, and we learn about the culture, and we learn about her interests. She was one of the first um, women to ride a bicycle in Staten Island. Tennis was actually founded in Staten Island. Her house was right next door to where the America's Cup race was held by the Yacht Club in New York. She's got all of these kinds of points of history that sort of um, converge on her. And um, I just find it a fascinating story. That is fascinating. I, I'm really curious, what does that mean? Both of these stories, both of these photographers, what does that, how does that make you think about like who an artist is and what it means to like make meaningful work. It's, it's a mindset. It's the way those two particular women lived their life. And they're amazingly similar, actually. The, the most important way is that they were both hoarders. <laughs> like literally, cla <laughs> like classic hoarders yeah. of stacks of newspaper, yeah. which is weird because Alice Austin's room in 1945 was described as having newspapers stacked to the ceiling which is also how Vivian Meyer's rooms were described. And she actually lost her job because there were too many newspapers. Like, I don't <laughs> know what newspapers and hoard, but they also then saved all their correspondence. They saved all their negatives. They saved things which give us their history. So by their personalities of being hoarders, which is what a photographer is. Yeah. Like, you're collecting and saving the images, that the things that you're seeing, basically. It sounds like they kind of shared, like, a level of consciousness about their experience and like the value of that maybe even well or they were more antisocial because when and in alice austin's case she's carrying like glass plate negative cameras and tripods yeah. along i actually oh so uh vivian's camera was is a i'm gonna mispronounce this a roll eye view finder is that correct rolly flex rolly flex i got a rolly for this class like a rolly 35 so when I saw that, I was like, that's so funny. It's from like 1970 or something like that. But it's a 35 millimeter. Yeah, it's this little guy. Yeah, she was using a twin. Yeah, I, I, I saw it, like I saw yeah. the pictures of her yeah. in, the, in, the, in the mirror. I, I, I could recognize that it yeah. was different, but I just thought that was crazy. And it, it just made me think about these like connections in time. You know, I bought this camera off the internet that had been floating around for decades well, and decades. Ex that, yeah, and I'm interested in that. I mean, I've always collected things for yeah. that same kind yeah. of reason. And I've had weird collections when I was a, in grade school. I collected hats. <laughs> <laughs> but not just like caps. I had like a fireman's hat, and I had a <laughs> beaver skin top hat, and I had a <laughs> I had like a Chicago crossing guards hat. Like, and I had them hanging in my bedroom in, in the house where I grew up, which is still there. <laughs> like a real fireman's hat? Oh. Yeah. And then I was like, oh my God, the life. Like, and it was a worn fireman's yeah, hat. Yeah, that's really interesting. And they're all in my bedroom. <laughs> and it was like all these, and it, it didn't really occur to me that all these people are in my bedroom. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it didn't occur to me till after, till later. And I think if it had occurred to me, they would have been down immediately because it's really creepy, <laughs> actually. Um, I really want to get into a little bit of your relationship to Chicago. I really like talking about that, and I think that you're a great person to ask about that, um, especially in seeing some of these projects that you worked on. So I'd love just to hear about what the city means to you, and especially how that relationship has developed as you've studied it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, like I said, my dad grew up in Humboldt Park, and yeah. my mom grew up in Lakeview, and I'm living in Uptown, which was where his dojo was when I was a child, which was a horrible neighborhood <laughs> then, and it's not yeah. a great neighborhood now. Um, and then Lincoln Park, because I did this other project that we haven't talked about, where I drilled into the history of the park, which is like what Chicago's famous for, this park on the, on the water. You mentioned to me earlier where you really discovered the cemetery that was kind of at yeah. in this place at one point in time. Yeah, so that project came right after 8th and 14th Street, and because I found the, the Chicago Tribune put their archive online, and I started noodling around. And with 
with searching for things, and there's a tomb in the park. And what happened is that I searched Couch Tomb, or I searched Lincoln Park Cemetery, and the way that these, this ProQuest site works hmm. is that whenever those words show up together in an article, they, you, you get the article back. And since this, this, the newspaper had just gone online, I'm reading these articles for the first time. And what I wanted to know in that project was, how did we lose the history of this park? Where, where did we, yeah. <laughs> why do we not know what yeah. happened here, and why isn't it obvious? And so I was reading the story of the, of, the par of the cemetery in real time, starting in 1858. And I basically put the story together, found these documents, like all these weird things, like all the Chicago Park District archive, including mm. like the minutes to the mm. Lincoln Park commissioners, they found in a sub-basement underneath Soldier Field in the 1980s. The Chicago City Council files were found in after the Freedom of Information Act in 1980-something. Um, they found them in a warehouse on the south side, like the actual crate with all the original documents that were then scanned and, and, and you know, put in chronological order. So I found all the primary documents, and I put back the history together, and I plotted out the, the cemetery grounds on Lincoln Park, and then finally asserted, which is why this made news, um, that they left 30,000 graves behind in the park, including 3,000 Confederate soldiers who are buried under the baseball diamonds, which no have way. been there since the founding of baseball, and the grounds that they can't do anything with because it's still a graveyard, and it's still in that state because there's been no plumbing, there's been, so I made this rollover map, what? like, yeah, so, so as I'm reading articles that combine Lincoln Park and Cemetery, the reason they come together is because they found evidence of the cemetery in Lincoln Park. So I made this map, and every time I found an art, they would describe by the water fountain yeah. in by the South Field House. So I put a yellow dot on that spot. And I started from reading these articles, sort of peppering the map with these dots. And then south of the southern border was the Catholic Cemetery, which is private. And actually, the Cardinal's Mansion is still there that was built in 1885. It's the most expensive piece of real estate in all of Chicago. <laughs> and there's a ton of graves. And all the houses were built without basements there. So every time someone digs a cellar or plants a garden, the legend has it that people who live in like the Gold Coast, the most exclusive area of Chicago, have bones in their collection, and they're human bones from the Catholic cemetery. So, <laughs> yeah, I, so then I put markers in the park saying, you know, called Hidden Truths and told the story that I was on Fox News because they wanted to know. <laughs> really? <laughs> Because they're like, is someone responsible for this? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, 125 years ago. Um, and a psychic went, and there was a psychic that went for another Fox TV show, and I show up in his, in his program, yeah. <laughs> and it turns out this is the best possible use of an art project. I have really good karma, I was told, because <laughs> I laid to rest these 30,000 forgotten souls. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Does it, I'm sure you appreciate it. I have no doubt you appreciate it. Does it strike you as really special, the fact that you get to spend your life like pursuing these true interests? Especially even what strikes me as really cool about it, when you talk about Vivian, these people were seeking you out because of your discussion and your genuine interest in that. I, I, I'd love just to hear your opinion on that and what that's been like for you. Which part? That the fact that, that, that you get to... Oh, that in I your in it. your day to day, in what yeah. you do, and what you, who yeah. you are, so is, is pursuing yeah. your genuine interests. Yeah, and that's because I teach, and I teach two days a week, and right now I'm teaching a Wednesday evening class also. So I'm off Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, as I've been for 30 years. I've had Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday off, but I never turn off. So yeah. Yeah. I have all that yeah. time to yeah. devote to these projects. So friends of mine, my peers who have traditional jobs and are now retiring, <laughs> and I'm like feeling like I'm just yeah, getting started because I'm like, really, <laughs> now I'm doing a podcast. Yeah. Um, and I'm on a podcast. Um, that that the, um, I lost my train of thought. That the, what was I talking about? This value of, of, of being able to pursue and like yeah, seek that, that I that I never turn off. Yeah, yeah. That I'm just yeah, so, I mean, I'm interested and I have time to do it. So what my friends who have traditional, you know, careers said, where do you have the time to do this? You know, they work a traditional job, they come home, they're wiped out, they turn on the TV. It's like, I don't even watch my TV. I have to say, I'm very inspired by it, and it's something that I 
want for myself desperately. Like number one thing, honestly, is to be able to line my life up in a way that I'm just excited about what I'm doing. Yeah, it's your life, yeah. you know, and so you cobble that together. You, you're doing this podcast, you know, the, <laughs> the Ben Ramos show, yeah, yeah. because you're not getting paid for this. No, like, I sure am not. Getting, you know, and no. I'm not, it, that's, that's the other thing. Like, my relatives are like, who's paying you to do this? I'm like, I'm lucky I have a job that I have a salary that I can do this. Like, I didn't get paid to make a website yeah. that I didn't get. I mean, I got paid to make, you know, the book that yeah. I did, but that was five years. And you have to, you have to start it without knowing how that's going to well, go. Well, and that's the thing. With the Vivian Meyer story, I was so invested in it, and I was so deep for five years, <laughs> oh and I didn't do any other project. Yeah. And then I was wiped out. And then, I mean, that my book came out in 2017. I'm just now, in yeah. the last year, getting into a new project, which is the, lo- I've, I've got, like, P- honestly, PTSD from that project, because, and then it was launched, and it was like, oh, my God, what was that? Yeah. And, and then I had to talk about it for a year after the book to keep, you know, book talks. And so um, then I, it was just like a standstill. Then mm. I didn't have anything. And it, for the first time in my whole adult life, I wasn't working on a project. Yeah. Because I was always yeah. making something or preparing for an exhibit. And the five-year thing just, like, wiped me out. Yeah. So I definitely I'm, see that. Yeah, I'm back now. <laughs> I'm back with Alice Austin. And, it's, and so if you, look at the tra- if you look at my project from yeah. a, as a, one sort of morphs to the next, hmm. there's a logic to it, even though, like, a podcast, there's not even anything visual. At least with the book, I could put in pictures. The, the line is very obvious to it, me. When that, you see them all next, yeah. and if I tell you how one leads to the other, but I teach... Like, I teach photography, and I'm, I mean, it, at least the, this project is also about a photographer. I'll be talking about history sure. of photography and, and things like that, but I'm following my own interests, and, you know, and it's ended up like that. We've just got, like, ten minutes left. I've got so a couple okay. of more questions I want to yeah. get into. We talked about your dad a lot, um, but I really like to ask this question about the traits a person sees in themselves that they think they got from their parents, so could you talk about that idea a little bit? Yeah, I think my curiosity and maybe this kind of obsessiveness. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not a hoarder, yeah. but I'm a collector. My yeah. dad was also yeah. a collector. Um, Nowadays, I know I've seen your shelf of old cameras. I'm, yeah, I imagine that's a part of your collection. But what do yeah. you collect? Well, I have 300 cameras. Oh, my God. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, when my dad died 10 years ago, and he was a collector, and all the stuff is still there, and now there's the burden of the collection. Yeah. I actually, I said, I don't want one more thing in my life. <laughs> and then someone found me because of the Vivian Meyer. They saw the video of me, and there's, I'm talking about her Rolleiflex, yeah. and I'm, you know, I'm talking about cameras. And he had come into uh, an inheritance of some eccentric uncle who collected cameras mm-hmm. and wanted to know if I wanted his uncle's collection. And I said, why, of course. Yeah, duh, obviously. So, <laughs> And I, right after I said I'm never, cl- so I got 120 extra cameras. <laughs> That's how my collection got to 300. What were your dad's collections? Um, my dad used to say he collected anything that collects dust. <laughs> and he collected everything from like these dainty Italian porcelains to anything that was bronze because he was working right. in bronze <laughs> to um, he basically the last 30 years of his life, he collected African art. So every form of African art you can imagine. Masks, standing figures, small figures, larger-than-life figures, um, bronzes, pipes, beaded things. Like, And then, because he had this liquor store standing in front of the cash register, they would find him. So these African runners would come, and they needed cash, and they had a truck full of work, and, what? and, <laughs> he, and he'd buy like the whole truck. Like There was these, these <laughs> antelope masks that the university, some museum in Wisconsin wanted this. It was like from some Shoot these ant. There were like ten of them, <laughs> and my dad's like, "I want all of them." So there's like ten antelope masks that are still <laughs> in the so house. ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, in random. And then he would just he just made an African room, and it was like all of, and he would just sit there and be surrounded by them. He um, sounds like a really interesting person. Yeah, and and very not typical Greek man. None of my relatives knew what to do with that. Did you get to know him well? Yeah, he was like my best friend. That's I worked in the liquor store for 10 years. Right, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and we, yeah, and he was, um, yeah, he was a storyteller, and he was just a real 
interest, he loved people, he loved to travel, he went to China with my mom, and he took Chinese lessons before he went, like, you're going to learn Chinese <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> before you go to China, and he took these, like, Berlitz, these like, really intense, and he recorded them, so there's these weird recordings of someone saying ma, and him saying ma, mm-hmm. and she'd say ma, and he'd say ma. like, he, you, I could hear he wasn't saying it the same yeah. way, and then he went there and ended up, like, trying to speak, and was saying things that were completely wrong, like introducing his wife as a jumping monkey, <laughs> like literally was one thing. Um, so, but he wasn't afraid. Yeah. And he loved people, and he loved being in the world, and he loved other cultures, and he was just a curious yeah. man. Which That's I, really wonderful. Yeah. I always finish up by asking about the pets a person had in their life. Could you talk about them? Well, that's funny. I haven't had a pet for a while, um, but I did have a dog from, two dogs from 1985 until 2015. I always had a dog. Um, I had Boston Terriers, They're, and they were always crazy because of my kind of erratic energy. I had a, a little 12-pound through right after graduate school, and then I had a hybrid, a dog my dad brought over because my other dog had just died, and I sent him home with the dog because I didn't ask for a dog, and it was a half Boston, half rat terrier named Buddy, which he named it Buddy, and uh, Buddy was awesome. Buddy had his own Facebook page and, <laughs> and followers. Buddy, w- Buddy was extremely yeah. photogenic, <laughs> and I took lots of pictures of Buddy, and they got published in this really? book. <laughs> yeah, so I was part of this community before, like, before Flickr, bef- you know, Instagram, Flickr, there was this group called Photolog in mm. 2003, 2004, and I still know people from this international community. We used to post pictures every day and comment on them. Then it went to Flickr, then it went to Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, then everything blew up. So like way at the beginning of, sh- it wasn't even, so. I guess it was social media, but um, it was Buddy's <laughs> photo log. And, um, it's interesting you yeah. say that because my, my, so I mentioned to you, I was really into film and video in, in high school, but they had a year of that, uh, which I took my sophomore year, and then I took a portfolio class the two subsequent years. So it was with all the advanced art students and the professor that ran it was the photo professor. And he absolutely despised when anybody ever hands in any picture of any of their oh, animals. <laughs> he specifically would like preface before the first time he, he'd like have a class, and he'd be like, do not submit pictures of your pets. <laughs> Which I mentioned to my um, intro class. In fact, one of my students, we had our first critique yesterday, submitted there were five dogs in his selection. And I actually made a comment that some photo instructors have taboo subjects that are off limits for subjects. I never do. Yeah. Photograph whatever you want. Yeah. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about if yeah. it's cliche. Yeah. We'll and you, I mean, I can imagine you doing a, a, like, for example, you could even do this, like, place-based thing about a dog if you wanted totally. to. And it could be yeah. pictures of a dog. So why, why mm-hmm. make that restriction? Yeah. Makes I don't, I don't have any restrictions. And You're I have a lot of pictures of my dog. <laughs> We're just at about an hour. I just wanted to thank you again for just coming on here. It really means a lot to me. I really feel lucky to be able to have this conversation with you. So thank you again. And thanks for asking me, Ben. And this is part of a project that you're (laughs) making in my class right now, which tell us real quickly about that because you're using this as a class assignment. Yeah. Um, We're doing the simultaneity assignment. So you you agreed to come over here with me today during our three-hour photo class in which Everybody is off all over Evanston, Chicago, taking their pictures. And we sat down and we had this conversation. So I'll be submitting a clip from this for that project. And it's all about everybody doing whatever they're doing during this three-hour stretch. And all the photographs are going to represent what was happening while you and I are having this conversation. And that's the kind of thing I'm interested in. I can't wait to see those pictures. I can't wait to watch this episode again, honestly. Thank you again. You're welcome. Take care. Thank you.